we're going to look into the muscular system. Let's take a look at the tissues of the muscular system. And so primarily we'll look at the skeletal muscle as kind of our basis for all the muscles and begin from there. So in this first part of the muscles, we'll get into a little bit of the basics of what we see inside the cells and what's inside the actual muscles and things like that as we look around. So when it comes to muscle, muscle essentially can do one thing. It can contract. And when it's not contracting, it can relax. And so it's going to go through this process of relaxation and contraction and relaxation and contraction over and over and over again. And when it contracts, generally we think of muscle as shortening at the same time. And that's really all that it can do as well. And so we can either generate force and not shorten and still have muscle contraction, or we can shorten the muscle and have contraction as well. And so with that, we generate force and, and the muscle shortens, but then we also have to have something that's going to lengthen the muscles because they can't re-lengthen themselves. So something else has to act upon them to do so. The muscles do their movement by converting chemical energy into a mechanical energy, similar to what we have in our car engines, is that we take the energy from the gasoline and we break those bonds in it. In the case of muscles, we're going to take ATP and break the bonds in it as well. And when we do so, we generate a energy that we can convert into a mechanical force that allows the muscles to contract. So we do have three kinds of muscles that we looked at back when we looked at tissues. And so we have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. The cardiac muscle and the smooth muscle are going to be talked about at the end primarily, but we'll get a little introduction into it here. For the skeletal muscle, this is our basis for all of our muscles. And so when we think of skeletal muscle, the name implies that it attaches to bone. So it's going to generally be associated with the skeletal system itself and or attaching into skin or fascia as well. And so we can do things like move our face and have facial expressions and so on. When we look at skeletal muscle, it is striated. It tends to be in long uh, muscle cells. And so they run the length of the muscle themselves. They're multinucleated. So we can see that we have multiple nuclei per cell. And so we're going to have upwards of 100 or so different nuclei in a single cell. And we'll talk about the reason why later on. And skeletal muscle is the only one that is voluntary. It's the only one that we can control when it contracts and when it relaxes. Cardiac muscle is similar to that of skeletal muscle in that it has striations. And that's about where the similarities end. And so skeletal muscle is, we said, was cylindrical and long. Cardiac muscle tends to be short. It tends to branch. So we all see all kinds of branches in it. It's single nucleated. Each individual cell has one nucleus within them as well. And both cardiac muscle and smooth muscle we're going to find are involuntary. They, we don't have any control over the, the muscle contraction itself. And in cardiac muscle, it has some special cells which are pacemaker cells. And so these cells generate the beginning electrical activity that begins contraction all on their own. The smooth muscle looks nothing like the other two. And so it is absent of any kinds of visible striations. So we don't see any of those there. It's involuntary, just like the cardiac muscle is. So we can't control it at all. It has more of a spindle shape. It's thicker in the middle and thinner on the ends for that particular muscle. And whereas skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle kind of have a single function, skeletal muscle basically being movement of the body, cardiac muscle being movement of blood, smooth muscle has all kinds of different jobs depending upon where we find it. And so everywhere from inside blood vessels and the digestive tract, kind of obvious ones, to being associated with hair follicles, those erector pili muscles, to being inside the eyeball and allowing us to change the size of our pupil. So lots of different functions, lots of different places where we can find smooth muscle. So when it comes to muscle, depending upon the type of muscle that we're talking about, 
uh, any number of these may apply. And so it moves something. And so whether it's going to be movement of the entire body, whether it's going to be movement of substances inside the body, everything from blood to hair follicles to urine, uh, food within the digestive tract, all kinds of different movements that we can use it for. Within those confines for especially things like movement of food, uh, we have the ability to use smooth muscle to do so. And that's going to allow us to not only move food along through the system um, within the body, but it's also going to allow us to control when these things occur. And so that's going to help out when we want to empty the stomach, when we want to maintain things in the stomach for a little while, and so on. And so we can use that as well. As muscles contract, that breaking of the bond also gives us heat. And so we have byproducts that come out of the, the hydrolysis of ATP. And when we do so, we end up getting heat. And so we end up with this byproduct. Similar to the car and the car engine, when the car engine burns the gasoline, we get heat as a byproduct as well. And so we can use this to our advantage when we're cold by shivering. Muscles have some properties that are unique to them within the body, um, to a certain degree, some of them. They are excitable, and so it doesn't take a whole lot to get a muscle cell to contract. And so they respond easily to chemical irritation, and so especially those of the skeletal system. And so nervous system releases a neurotransmitter, and it tells the muscle to contract. And so it's stimulated by that uh, chemical that's there. When we stimulate that muscle cell, it allows for an electrical impulse to be generated in the muscle, and this gives the muscle its conductivity. And so it has the ability to conduct electricity through it, uh, to propagate an action potential through the muscle cell itself. They are contractile, so we can shorten them and generate a force, or we can lengthen them and generate a force, or not change the length and generate a force as well. When that muscle is being pulled upon by either gravity or another muscle and it's being lengthened, it has the ability to be stretched without causing any harm, up to a point. And so we do have that ability to stretch out the muscles, but then at the same time, they will bounce back. And so they are elastic. They will come back to their normal shape, their original shape and length after they've been stretched out. Muscles, just like all the rest of our uh, tissues in the body itself, are surrounded by different types of connective tissues. And so similar to what we saw in bones, where we had different kinds of connections that surrounded each portion, uh, we have a similar process here with muscles. <clears throat> and so essentially the first thing covering over the muscles is the skin, and then deep in the skin, we have that hypodermic layer, our superficial fascia. And so this is that deepest layer that surrounds the, the whole body itself, and that surrounds the muscles as well. Surrounding the actual muscle, we have deep fascia. And so deep fascia now surrounds that muscle. It's dense, irregular connective tissue, so it can be pulled in multiple directions within the, the tissue itself. From there, we then kind of package up the cell into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller components. And so that deep fascia blends into connective tissue that is essentially working to package up the whole muscle. We have epimecium. And then within that whole muscle, we're going to take a series of individual muscle cells and bundle them together. And so these bundles are what we're going to call fascicles. And so fascicles are going to be surrounded by paramecium. And that paramecium is going to bundle up 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 cells within the muscle, depending upon how big the muscle is and, and what the muscle's intended job is. And then each individual cell, which is inside that fascicle, is surrounded by endomecium. And so each individual cell has its own connective tissue that surrounds it as well. And so we're going into smaller and smaller smaller and smaller packages basically within that muscle. 
And so the epimesium here, we can see that it starts to blend into the tendon, and then the tendon actually blends into the periosteum that covers the bone. And so all of that connective tissue kind of has like a continuous connection all the way into the bone itself. Creating the fascicles and surrounding those individual fascicles themselves, we have the paramecium. And so that creates that kind of separation in between chunks of muscle cells. And that then creates a place for each individual muscle cell or fiber to lie. And so we have individual cells here within the fascicles themselves. These ones are a little bit further spaced apart. And so we've got different muscle cells there. And each one of those is then surrounded by that endomesium. And so that separates each one within the entire muscle itself. In order to control the muscles, so since it's a voluntary muscle, we need to have nerve supply coming into the muscle. And so we have a vast network of neurons that come into and supply the, the muscle. And those are going to be sub supplied by a single nerve, typically. Uh, blood supply coming into the muscle is typically going to be supplied by a artery. And so, but depending upon the size of the muscle, there may be more than, than one main artery coming into it. <clears throat> and then we have at least two veins draining the muscle, again, depending upon the size of the muscle that's there. The nerve supply that comes in, comes in and gives us individual neuron connections. And so those neurons then spread out over the entire muscle and they're going to innervate individual cells. So one motor neuron and all of the muscle cells that it communicates with and this could be hundreds of cells that it that one motor neuron communicates with is what we call a motor unit and so a motor unit is each one of the neurons and all of the cells that it actually communicates with and so we have this kind of unit of contraction that's there where the neuron actually meets the muscle cell, this is what we call the neuromuscular junction. And so that's the, the actual connecting point between the neuron and the muscle cell itself. So each muscle cell has only a single connection to a motor neuron. And so only one cell of the muscle can connect to a motor neuron. And so only one motor neuron talks to a single muscle cell. But that one motor neuron may talk to 10, 15, 20 cells at all the exact same time. So here we can see nice blood supply, lots of capillaries going through the whole muscle cell itself, um, surrounding the muscle and allowing for that good supply of oxygen and glucose to the cell. Neuromuscular junctions, we have our connection between the cell of the neuron and that of the muscle cell. And that allows us to have that communication. And this one neuron, as it comes in, is going to split and have multiple connections to different muscle cells. And they're all going to contract at the same time. But that one motor neuron does not tell the entire muscle that it needs to contract. And so from the very beginning, when we started talking about connective tissue and muscle tissue and epithelium and, and nervous tissue, we said that skeletal muscle had more than one nucleus. It was multinucleated. And so we get that from a very early point in the development where individual muscle cells, so we get these muscle cells here start to fuse to one another. And so they start to fuse to one another and they developed from myoblasts. The myoblasts are the stem cells and they develop into the individual uh, muscle cells and then they start to fuse to one another. And so what that gives us is a cell that has a large number of nuclei. These cells, although they have lots of nuclei, they're not gonna use those nuclei for division they're going to use them for proteins. 
manufacture of proteins. And so muscle growth occurs because of enlargement of the cells, not from cell division. So it does not occur because the cells divide. If we want to have bigger muscles, we've got to make the actual cells themselves larger. And so that allows for that to occur and we can do it relatively quickly within them. Because they don't divide, they are amitotic. Essentially, this cell here is going to be around for the life of the person. And so what we have is what we get in a sense as far as the individual cells are concerned. So muscle fibers, the individual cell that we have there, we're going to further package things up even smaller and smaller and smaller. And so each individual cell is surrounded by a plasma membrane, and that plasma membrane is referred to in skeletal muscle as the sarcolemma. And so sarco meaning muscle and myo meaning muscle. Anytime that we see those two, we're going to think that it has something to do with muscle. And so something along the lines of muscle is being talked about. So instead of cytoplasm, we have sarcoplasm. Same thing, basically. We've got all the fluid that's inside the cell, everything that can be dissolved in it, everything that's floating in it is the sarcoplasm. What the sarcoplasm has in skeletal muscle is a large amount of mitochondria. And then what's not pictured here is a large amount of myoglobin, the ability to store oxygen within the cell itself. That sarcoplasm is not continuous. And so it's not one big sheet that surrounds the cell. It actually has little invaginations. And these little invaginations are like tubes that go down into the cell. Inside the actual tube, so we have our plasma membrane and then we go down the tube, that tube is filled with extracellular fluid. So it has the same content inside as what we have on the outside. It's the same substance that lies within the extracellular fluid as we have inside these T-tubules here. So these tubes, these transverse tubules or T-tubules are utilized to get ions and more specifically to send our electrical potential along the surface and then down into the T-tubule. And that's going to get us down closer to our sarcoplasmic reticulum and more specifically down to the expansion of the sarcopla sarcoplasmic reticulum there. Within the cytoplasm, we then have individual myofibrils. And so these myofibrils are the uh, protein components of the cell itself. And so myofibrils are made up of what we call thick filaments and thin filaments. And so we see them inside. And that's what's going to give that characteristic kind of uh, striated appearance to the muscle. And you can actually kind of see it here that we have kind of a dark area and then we have a light area. And then we have a dark area and then we would have a light area. And so that alternates and that gives us that kind of characteristic striated appearance of our skeletal muscle. The sarcoplasmic reticulum we talked a little bit back when we did the cells and when we talked about them under the cells we talked about sarcoplasmic reticulum being in skeletal muscle this is just simply smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So it's smooth endoplasmic reticulum and here it's going to store calcium and so calcium is going to get stored inside the cell and when triggered that calcium is going to flood the inside of the cell with calcium. And so the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to release calcium and it's just going to flood the inside with huge amounts of calcium. And this is what's going to allow us to contract the muscle. Muscles need to be stimulated. So we said that we had nerve supply coming to the muscles and they need to be stimulated all the time. Not necessarily always be working, but getting some sort of stimulus coming to the muscles themselves. <clears throat> if we don't maintain the same level of activity and the same uh, amount of kind of strenuousness on the muscle, the muscle is going to start to atrophy. 
And so it's going to start to reduce the amount of proteins that are there. Essentially, maintaining skeletal muscle is kind of expensive for the body. It takes a lot of energy to do so. And so if we don't need it, we get rid of it. Rid of it. And so the old saying of use it or lose it is definitely true. And so atrophy is just simply wasting away of muscles. And this can come in two, for two reasons. One, either disuse. And so say you have a broken bone, that broken bones in a cast, things like that. And the limb shrinks. The muscle started to atrophy inside. We can also denervate the, the muscle, which means to take the nerve supply away from the muscle. And this can be because of spinal cord injury. This can be because of uh, a cut in the skin has severed a nerve. Uh, this can be from uh, damage to the nerve in one way or another, um, sleeping in the wrong way, etc. And so denervation atrophy causes the muscle to start to shrink and basically permanently. And so we're not going to be able to get that muscle back if the reason for the insult doesn't get fixed. When we build muscle, we go through hypertrophy. And so this is going to increase the diameter of the muscle fibers, not the actual numbers of cells. And so this is going to increase the amount of myofibrils, the amount of potentially mitochondria, the amount of sarcoplasmic reticulum, all of the organelles of the cell, including the contractile fibers, are going to increase in their size. And so in the numbers of proteins rather than the numbers of cells. So when atrophy occurs, that's going to start to damage the muscle and it can be permanent. And so here we have atrophy in this region of the palm. And so you can compare the two sides there. This side here in the right hand is nice and, in a sense, plump. There's a lot of muscle tissue there. In the left hand, it's essentially all gone. And so it's missing there. We can also see that in between, in the palm, there appears to be indentations. Those indentations are where muscle mass has been lost in between the fingers as well. And so this damage here is relatively permanent, probably. Uh, surgery to get the pressure off of the, the nerve is probably not going to work. The median nerve has been irrevocably damaged. It's been damaged beyond repair that the body can do. Sarcomeres are the smallest functional contractile unit of a muscle. And so we said that in the, from the beginning that we're going to make things smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as we have them in the, the muscle cells themselves. And so the sarcomere is just that. It's the, the smallest area that we have. And so with that, we have Z-disc to Z-disc. That's the, the boundary of our sarcomere. And within it, we have several different structures that we can find. And so we have some different regions that we'll look for within the sarcomere itself. Inside the sarcomere, this is where we're getting our banding. This is where we're getting the striated appearance of muscle in that we have thick filaments, the darker structures there, and then we have thin filaments. And so we have two different kind of, of appearances to the proteins themselves. One's a thin protein, one's a thick protein. That's there. The thick protein, our myosin, is basically by itself. It works alone. The thin filament has actin, troponin, and tropomyosin. And so we've got multiple proteins that are all associated with one another, and that gives this light region appearance that's there for those. So when we look at a particular sarcomere, so that sarcomere once again goes from Z-disc to Z-disc, we have a couple of different regions that we can see. And so we have the A-band. The A-band goes from the edge of a thick filament to the edge of the thick filament. 
And so it's bounded simply by the size of the thick filament. And that's it. For our H zone, the H zone is an area where we have thick filament only. And so all we have here is thick filament. And so this whole area here is all the H zone. The I band is an area where we have only thin filament. And it starts over here at the edge of the thick filament. And it's going to go all the way into the next sarcomere. So our I band goes from there all the way over to here. And so we have that change within the the sarcomeres and so it actually spans two sarcomeres and we'll see that these change when we have contraction of the muscles and so the the processes themselves are going to change depending upon uh, what's happening within the muscle in terms of the the contraction process that's there and so they're going to change in their size in the very center we have the M line and so this M line aligns up our thick filaments. The Z discs themselves hold on to our thin filaments. And so the yellow is the thin filament. And then they're also connected to by this kind of corkscrew looking structure here, the Titan filaments. The Titan filaments work a lot like a spring, just kind of like they look there. And so they allow for the muscle to be stretched out and then it helps them to bounce back in. Uh, electron micrograph showing those same I band, A band, H zone within the cells themselves. And then the dark line in the center is our M line. We can see the Z discs there within them as well. And that gives us that dark and light and dark and light and dark and light appearance of skeletal muscle. When we use skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle, especially when it gets used in a sense to its maximum. So if we fatigue the muscle and we're using it and it's working and working and working, uh, there's the potential that that muscle begins to experience fatigue. And if we keep on going into fatigue, that can lead to essentially small tears within the sarcolemas. This can lead to damage to the sarcolema. This can lead to damage of the myofibrils, the individual proteins that are inside the, the cells. This can damage the Z discs. And with that damage, we're going to leak some proteins out into the extracellular fluid that's going to draw water into it. And we end up with swelling in the muscle we end up with soreness in the muscle that usually starts to accumulate in a sense 12 to 48 hours or so afterwards. This is where that soreness and that swelling and stiffness comes into play after we've worked out strenuously. The proteins that we have within the muscle are, are several different kinds. And so we said that we had acted in myosin those were the actual contractile proteins that we had. And so those are our thick filament, the myosin, primarily the thin filament made up of actin. But actin also has troponin and tropomyosin. But these are regulatory proteins. These are kind of like a lock and a key. And a door is going to come together on the actin. In addition, we then have a couple of other proteins that we talked about. We have Titan, so our spring. We have myomycin. This is, helps to uh, get the tension from the muscle to the tendon. And then we have, or I'm sorry, the, the myomycin is the M line. Dystropin is the protein that's going to help to get the, the force to the tendons. And then nebulin kind of works like myomycin, except that it works on the thin filaments, and so it helps to hold them together. So here we have kind of a close lookup of a myosin. And so an individual myosin protein has kind of a golf club twisted around one another appearance. And so we have the two heads of the golf club. 
and then the shafts get twisted around one another and then several of those get put together with the one another inside the sarcomere that's there the m line the myomesin helps to hold all of those in their normal place that's there the thin filament is made up of primarily actin and that's going to be to be our contractile protein and then we also have troponin the blue one and tropomyosin all of these brown almost like stick looking structures that are there as well and the troponin and tropomyosin help to regulate when contraction can occur and we'll talk about that later on um, so they're regulatory rather than being contractile filaments themselves Titan filaments help to hold on to the Z disc. So it holds on to the Z disc there. It goes through the M line in the center and then attaches on the other side to another Z disc. So this is where we get that stretch capability of the muscle that's there. And so if we stretch and stretch and stretch, we typically are going to fire off neurons that say we're stretching that muscle, but it's the muscles themselves that potentially save them from that contraction or that lengthening of the muscle as another muscle is contracting. And then we have the M line or the myomesin. And so this is helping to hold all of those thick filaments in place. We have on the thin filaments, we have nebulin. And so this is going to help to hold all of our thin filaments in place. And so that helps to hold them together there. And then at the very ends of the muscle, we have dystrophin, which essentially comes together and helps to translate that tension from the muscle into tendons. And next up, we'll start to get into the more physiology of the muscle.